This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Doug Grinnick. He is the CEO of Floor and Court Capital, a trend following trader, and they've got a very unique take on trend following. They are trading the alternatives to the alternatives. 500 plus diverse markets, many of which you've probably never heard of, but that's the opportunity that Doug has spotted and I give him credit. Without any further delay for me, let's jump right in with my guest today, Doug Grenick and talk a little bit about very, very diverse trend following. I hope you enjoy this conversation. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I'm a little sore from yesterday's workout, but I'm doing well. You're going to have to, because as somebody who likes to work out a lot, I'm going to have to at least probe a little bit to find out the type of workout that you are mentioning. Oh, I love lifting weights. I love resistance training. And I'm not doing it because I want to become some narcissistic asymptote or something. I really just do it for the endorphins. It feels absolutely wonderful to me. And I go pretty heavy. So it's something I really enjoy and I find relaxing. I've been doing it now. What? We're doing it now close to 40 years on and off. Yeah, the endorphin release. And I'm sure in a way, like, okay, you have your passion, your business, your trading, but I'm sure there's a certain part of your life where you, for somebody who expresses that quickly, their love of lifting, their love of exercise, you build a significant part of your life around this, I'm guessing. I would say so. It's a meditative activity. Zen meditation. The goal is to clear one's mind. But there are other things that you can do, whether it's running, for example, or weight training, where if you clear your mind and you immerse yourself in that moment, maybe you could do it painting, I don't know, but you immerse yourself in that moment, it becomes a source of relaxation and a mental and spiritual cleansing, that immersion. And so I find it very relaxing and I'm very refreshed. And when I'm doing it, I'm thinking about the next five reps, just what I'm doing. It's a lovely experience. I'm sure you've felt the same when you've trained in the past. Absolutely. In fact, today, my life involves running, yoga, Pilates, box jumping, high intensity interval training, a lot of these types of things. And I do it for the same reason you do it, which is the endorphins. Here I am in Southeast Asia. I'm envious of the assorted monks, Buddhist practitioners across this area that can get themselves into that meditative place without the physical exertion. But I have so far, maybe I'm just too immature, I need the physical exertion to get myself to the endorphin release. There are some schools of Buddhism that involve walking meditation. I think it's called walking zazen. I think it's actually, for a lot of people, it's a real pathway to that contemplative state. But as you say, there are other people who can do it with the breath counting or just clearing their minds. It's a very nice thing, however you get there. The people hear podcasts these days, hear longer form interviews. Perhaps it's not so original, but generally if you flip on a Bloomberg or a CNBC, you're not going to hear a fund manager talking about the importance of these types of things. But I'm sure that what you're describing, the way you keep yourself physically, the way you keep your mind, this endorphin release, this ties in naturally to your business, to the way that you run your life, the way you run your trading. I try to apply myself to what I do and think carefully about the world and be receptive and perceptive about my environment. You're taking in information about the world. You're building models. You're thinking about how your strategy works and how it might work better. But that requires a certain calmness of mind and receptivity and some energy. It's interesting. You need that energy, but you also need to be taking things in as well as putting stuff out. Life, it's this balance. 
I try to achieve it, but I can certainly say that exercise is something that's a big part of my day and my life. I'm right there with you. So I second that notion. I tell you, here's where I want to jump in, in terms of the trading conversation. Had a chance to see your most recent uh, monthly report for December, 2023. It was an interesting write up. I quickly got to the end and I, I wanted to just share the ending paragraph because I think it really is a great starting place for you and I in this conversation today. And this is quoting from you and it says, slowing economies, geopolitical misjudgments, war risks, mountains of sovereign debt, populism and polarization and unpredictable elections. 2024 presents risks from every angle. We believe that our time-tested, global-spanning, trend-following program can play a positive role in most allocator portfolios. Now, I know exactly what you're saying, and I'm sure there's plenty of people around the world that know exactly what you're saying. What I found interesting, though, is that you give a very nice macro, in-depth explanation for people to understand what you're seeing right now. Here are just the facts, ma'am. But then essentially you get to the end, and you can correct me if I'm describing this wrong, but essentially you get to the end, you say, yeah, but you know what? We really can't predict anything, and we can't trade what I'm describing effectively without our program. From the standpoint of an allocator, a very good starting point for any analysis for putting together a collection of investments, a portfolio of investments, very good starting point is trying to have a sense for what the world is like. Is it stable? Is it unstable? What are the major macro trends taking place over months, years, and decades? What assumptions also might I have acquired from my youth, from my background, that might not be applicable to the world that's unfolding in front of us? Speaking for myself, for example, I grew up in a wonderful environment in America, in the Pax Americana, there was a sense that we were in control of the world, we being the Western alliance led by America, that there was this forward thrust of progress. We were headed toward a better place. Yes, there were injustices and problems in the past, but the arrow of progress points up. We're going in a stable way. I mean, Francis Fukuyama, I think it was in the 1990s, wrote a book called The Last Man and the End of History. I believe that was the title. And his idea was basically, from a general intellectual standpoint, we had already figured everything out. Liberal democracy, mixed economies, the world as we understood it in Western Europe and the United States. That's the only way. That's the only viable model for the future, with a few variations. But that's the basic idea. Getting to the point that you asked me about, the thing that I am challenging is the assumptions of that Pax Americana. I'm saying we're in a very unstable world, and that has big implications for allocators, okay? I think there was an advertising campaign in the 1980s, and it was something like, this isn't your dad's Oldsmobile. They were trying to reinvent the Oldsmobile brand and make it cool. Or what's that Buick? This isn't your grandfather's Buick. It was something along these lines. Well, this isn't your dad's economy. This isn't your grandfather's or grandmother's economy. This is a different world we're in. And that's what I'm trying to say. So there's some big implications for allocators, in particular a need to address the tails, to address non-stationarity. Then beyond that, of course, you may very well choose managers who have particular views on things. But one of the things that we basically offer is exposure to major trends, whatever the direction may be. That's systematic trend following. What we require is big moves, sustained moves. And we think the environment that I just described there, gigantic piles of debt, multipolarity, this isn't your dad's world order. This is an emerging multipolar world order. And all of these things, this points to the idea that you're going to see major dislocations, big trends, and big moves over coming years and decades. Let me give you the floor to take us back in time. Because for one, to have that description of the current events and to have a sense of where you are in history, 
to where your trading approach is in history, this requires an origin. There had to have been a moment where, because look, again, I could flip on Bloomberg today and there's going to be assorted talking heads telling me what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, maybe they'll say something similar to you, but then they're going to have a more concrete, I know exactly what's going to happen. Whereas your approach is more, like you said, in the trend following space, like, hey, things are uncertain. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. I can't give you the exact timing, but we're ready and able. So for you, was there a moment, when did this happen where you first understood this concept of trend following and how did that happen? My career has been a series of steps. I started out as a discretionary fixed income and macro trader at Goldman Sachs. We used models, particularly when we were looking at yield curves and relative value on yield curves, but we also took views. And it is a perfectly legitimate and appropriate way to trade and great fortunes over the years have been created that way. And there's some people who do it in a very wonderful way. But one of the things that struck me over the years, particularly in looking at fixed income, is how non-stationary the world is and how unsure we are about so many of the relevant variables. For example, we used to have the idea of the Phillips curve. That was an idea in neo-Keynesian and Keynesian economics, a relationship between inflation and unemployment. Another version of the same story was Nehru, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. That's the level of unemployment that's merely frictional. And if you try to get below that, you're actually trying to run beyond potential GDP. Again, to use the basic sort of Keynesian terms there. And over the years, we began to discover that the Phillips curve doesn't really exist. It's just nonsense on stilts. When you look at it over time and you end up having to have a short-term Phillips curve, a long-term Phillips curve, a medium-term Phillips curve, it's just this big cloud of points. It's not a stationary relationship. And likewise, it used to be thought that Nehru was 6% and then it's 4 and 5%. Now it's 3.5%. It's not stationary. In fact, if you study it closely, we're not even sure what a good general theory of inflation is. Probably the best theory available, which is imperfect, are the more classic monetarist models of inflation coming out of Irving Fisher and the quantity theory of money and the equation of exchange. I think the models that came out of real business cycle theory later were sort of a big failure. And of course, most of the Keynesian and neo-Keynesian models of the last few years completely missed the recent inflation. So as a fixed income trader, I saw how non-stationary and unpredictable the world is. I also began to realize that even if you had a huge amount of information about what's going to happen in the world, that doesn't tell you what the prices are going to be. Imagine you have future newspaper headlines but you don't have the financial pages. How good would you be at predicting prices? Think about the behavior, for example, of stock prices through the pandemic and the pandemic recovery and things like that. Think about what's happened with bonds. Think about the fact that the yield curve is inverted now, even though we're running 8% of GDP deficits in the US and the fiscal outlook is just about as alarming as you can get. People should take a look at the Penn Wharton budget model. They want to get frightened about the future. You begin to realize that there's a huge amount of non-stationarity. Knowing future events doesn't necessarily tell you enough to trade prices. Although sometimes it does. Sometimes it does, but a lot of times it doesn't. And you begin to realize the older you get, just how much structural change is going on in the world, how non-stationary everything is. I think that insight made me very, very receptive to the ideas of not fighting the tape, going with the flow, following the trend, but then using volatility as your signal for entry and exit. Because when narratives change and trends change, there's usually a burst of volatility. And that fact is absolutely essential to trend following the way we do it. Do you have, going back in your early times starting out, do you have any stories you want to share, insights, connections, 
of how you started to come into this very specific world of trend following influences? I was brought on board as the head of risk at AHL. It was an interesting opportunity to work for a great firm and come to London. And of course, AHL has played a big role in the history of trend following. They brought me in, in part because I had such a diverse background as a macro trader, as a quant, I have a PhD in mathematics from Berkeley. I worked with Fisher Black for a number of years and did work in uh, macroeconomic theory with him. They brought me in as someone with this broader background. It was just a tremendous opportunity to learn a vast amount because that's an organization with a very deep history in trend following. But I also asked a lot of questions and conducted many experiments to understand the world better. So for example, how important is it to scale with volatility? Because remember I mentioned that when there's a Minsky model of the world where narratives emerge, trends emerge, and then as the narrative starts to change, there'll be a period of distress and enhanced volatility in many cases before the trend changes. And if you want to detect that, you need a pretty fast moving estimator of volatility. How important is that? And I was able to learn that it's actually incredibly important. Work that I've done at Floor and Court indicates that if your volatility isn't reactive, you lose as much as half of your sharp ratio. It's just as important as the trend. In any case, the work that I did at AHL, and I enjoyed working there very much, I really came to love the trend following space. It tied out very much philosophically. I'm a bit of a student of history, I'm very interested in the world. The idea that the world does have fat tails, that things are non-stationary, that the 1950s and 1960s, this period of peace and calm after World War II, where the U.S. was in charge and was sort of the unipole, at least economically, if not militarily, that's an exceptional period. That's not what the world's normally like. The mess that we are developing now is a more typical state of affairs. Do you find it interesting internally when you have an internal conversation with yourself, a guy like yourself that starts with this very interesting background that is not a trend following background early on. So you have this deep macro understanding, this deep mathematics understanding, then you get exposed to something like trend following, but you still have many. And as you said, plenty of people have used their ability to, let's say, predict or to have views about what's going to happen and they've made money that way. But we are talking about trend following today. So here you are, this guy's got this background of one way of thinking in a way, and then you get exposed to trend following. Do you ever just think to yourself, is it unusual to you that you have such a deep background? Let's just call it for lack of a better term, the fundamentals. And then you shift into this trend following mindset. It is unusual, but it has helped us design better systematic models. We have, for example, a systematic macro fund. It's fully systematic, but it's non-trend. We've been trading that for a time now. It actually had a very successful year last year, but it has all sorts of interesting non-trend systematic indicators and variables and signals. Some of these come out of the understanding I've described. And I might add, there's a 7% allocation to those signals in the main trend program. It's seasoning on the trend dish. The main course is trend, but it can give you a bit of a tilt toward the markets where there is better relative value, better opportunity, and it's contributed meaningfully to the performance of our portfolio over the last four years. So a word that I want to bring up with you, diversification. In the typical traditional thinking of diversification is one way, and the trend following diversification is another way. I'm going to let you take the floor and explain and contrast for the audience. I've always found the interesting thing about trend following is just hypothetically, we're starting year one, day one, and we have this basket of markets that we're looking at, and we don't know what's going to happen. We're hoping they all start to move. We hope they all start to trend, but we don't know which one will but we're ready. We're ready, willing, and able to participate on the one that might take off or the many that might take off. 
Again, I want you to contrast this trend following diversification towards what people might typically think of diversification, but also from a trend following perspective, you are diversifying much, much wider than typical. 1,500 single name cash equities that you're following. I mean, beyond that too, you've got a much different take on trend following. I'm not sure the take is that different, but I think we've carried it. We've realized its potential. You're not going to find any CTAs, at least not to my knowledge, who are trend following only 10 markets. You're not going to find managed futures programs where people say, I'm just doing these 10, the S&P, cable. It's not enough. It's not enough. And part of the reason is the signal is just not that good. It's a weak signal that sometimes works very well and has positive convexity but does not have a very high sharp ratio. Your sharp ratio in any individual market is just a very small positive number. You're synthesizing volatility, which is costly. Sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, but it's small. But when you start to get to 50, 75, 100 markets, and the correlations aren't perfect, so you're getting effectively, let's say, five or six or seven independent bets out of those markets, truly independent bets. Then it starts to come into its own. It's a little bit like the difference. If you went to a casino and it had two blackjack tables, the, the revenue, the profitability of the casino from that activity might not be that high. If, on the other hand, it had 50, that small edge on each table gets combined to produce a big edge on the overall program. That's how CTAs get to a sharp ratio of, typical CTA has a sharp ratio of about 0.4. That's what we think. It's somewhere in that neighborhood, but with a lot of positive skew since it's a long volatility strategy, as long as you're trading fast enough. Now, what if you keep going? What if you actually go out and try to find funky, odd markets, different things, alternative markets, Turkish interest rates, Malaysian palm oil, crossover credit default swaps, California carbon emissions, wet freight from the Middle East to the China Gulf, French electricity, South African maize, steel rebar onshore in China, Hungarian interest rates, UK inflation swaps, a bunch of markets like this. Well, first off, you can tell just from the way I've described them, they don't have a whole lot to do with each other the pairwise correlations are going to be a fair bit lower. And there are hundreds of them. It's just a difficult operational lift. So our ballgame is instead of trading 75 standard CTA markets, futures and FX forwards, dollar yen, Brent futures, Bund futures, S&P futures, this stuff. Instead of doing that, we're trading Turkish interest rates, Colombian interest rates, credit default swaps, more than four dozen Chinese commodities, ranging from peanut kernels to methanol. We trade electricity in many places around the world, carbon emissions, all these different things. We end up with about 500 markets, and the correlations among them are lower. We found the trends are better because they're less efficient markets. Not everybody is trading California carbon emissions. Not everyone is trading wet freight. Not everyone is trading Turkish interest rates. In fact, very few systematic shops are trading these things. Doug, can you, for the audience, plenty of people know exactly what you're talking about and why you can trade these diverse, exotic, unusual markets, these 500 markets that you're giving the sampling of some of them. Plenty of people listening know exactly why you have the ability to trade all these diverse markets. But some people listening might be thinking, God, that guy Doug has got some, him and his shop, they've got some amazing staff on board that understand all of the fundamentals and all of the macro specifics to trade these versus, again, correct me if I'm wrong, you've made these markets all similar by trading their price. That's right. The main signal will be signals derived from trend, from price trend and volatility. And the concept is pretty simple. With the exception of certain markets that are controlled in various ways, let's say a currency that's pegged, 
with the exception of some stuff like that, which obviously doesn't fit into this framework. All markets can trend, whether we're talking about dollar yen or Turkish interest rates or the Turkish lira. The concept is to go, basically, there are complicated mathematical models behind all this, but the idea is pretty simple. You flow with the trend, and when volatility gets higher, you cut risk. When volatility gets lower, you increase risk up to certain limits. There's an art to doing this, and there are a number of shops that are quite good at building these kinds of models. But the name of our game is we're the alternative markets guys. We have a tremendous amount of experience, starting with Tony Benitsky, our COO, who had been the head of trade investment operations, AHL. This is a guy who lives and breathes solving operational problems. And the markets you described, the diversification you described, the different countries you described, from my perspective, here I am sitting in Ho Chi Minh City right now, that's an operational nightmare. Yes. And the fact of the matter is, of all the people in the market, my team probably has the most experience doing this. We're as good as anyone. We've been doing it a long time. We're a very, very experienced group of people, and we're focused on just this. I'm not trying to become an expert on Turkish interest rates and on what Erdogan will do next. I don't know what the next move will be in California with respect to its emissions market. The problem that we're solving is how do we get the data and solve how do we deal with the operational issues so we can apply trend-following algorithms that are tried and true algorithms. These are the kinds of algorithms that good CTAs have been applying for years to 50, 75, 100 developed markets. But magic happens when you can do the operational lift and apply them to 500 markets. Ron Kahn and Richard Grenold had this, I think it's called the fundamental law of active management. And it's risk-adjusted performance equals breadth times skill. So think of the trend-following algorithm as providing a measure of skill. The breadth, the number of independent bets you have on your sharp ratio basically goes up with the square root of that number as a rough rule of thumb. We believe, based on the measurements and statistics we do, that we're somewhere between four and nine times better diversified than a standard CTA portfolio. How did you first decide, or when did you first decide, the opportunity that you are living right now? Because like you're, you're describing, most traditional trend-following approaches are going to stay at the big liquid markets that everyone knows. You've left that reservation, so to speak. Well, AHL, where I worked as a chief risk officer, and I was also the head of what we called the portfolio management group, they were a pioneer in the idea of alternative markets. Every CTA has their special sauce. And one of the special flavors that I encountered when I arrived at AHL was their emphasis on adding new diversifying markets. And I think it's very much correct. And of course, they have an outstanding fund that does exactly this. But I got the chance when I started my own business later to get out a clean sheet of paper and create a fund that's totally focused on this and built from the ground up the way I want the idea of the alternative market CTA, that was a concept that emerged first at AHL. Tony Vinitsky, my COO, was part of that in the 2000s, and AHL has a very distinguished track record. As you might imagine, I've heard a lot of different things about trend following over the years, so I always enjoy hearing something new. I do like your motto here, the better markets plus better diversification equals better performance. I like that word better. I don't see that used in marketing often a lot. I stole this from, this was not a good choice, from Papa John's. Really? Ah, uh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> oh my God, you're right. Now I know. Yes. <laughs> there was this controversy later about the guy who ran the place. What was his name? John Schnatter or something. But when I came to London to work for AHL, I lived not very far from the office. They have a beautiful building down on Swan Lane, Riverbank House. And I lived not too far away in Clarkenwell in an Art Deco building called Florin Court. Florin Court in the Agatha Christie 
mystery series is the residence of Hercule Poirot. It's this beautiful art deco building with a curved facade on Charterhouse Square. That was the origin of the, the Florin Court name. Your firm's name, just to be clear with the audience. Like word association almost, but in the news right now, and I want to see how your brain works. Let people share how you think about things. Because of course, you've got your systematic approach, you've got your rules. There's very specific things you do when markets start to move. What I'm about to say is not going to be something that you typically would use in your investment process. Somebody else might, but you would not. At least I'm guessing you would not. So it's just in the news in the last 24 hours or so, I guess, that Evergrande in China, the Hong Kong court has said must liquidate. I think it's 200 billion or 300 billion. It's a huge thing. So now when you, given the approach that you have and given the background you have that goes back over time, when you hear something like that in the news, what does your thinking say? Do you just say, ah, oh, it's a piece of trivia, interesting nugget. Do you do anything with information like that anymore? No, we're systematic. I don't really do anything. Although when investors talk to me, sometimes they're interested in hearing my view of the world and they like to have a conversation. Maybe I'll say something that will lead them to make a good observation in an investment committee. And I certainly like to learn from them and hear about what they're doing. I'm interested in the world. I'm not just a quant with my numbers. But as far as our investment process is concerned, it's 100% systematic. You can't get more systematic than we are. We're fully systematic. We follow the models. Now, of course, we think about the models. And as I mentioned, some of our models incorporate ideas from macro, but they don't incorporate views. They might incorporate the idea that the current account deficit, the trend in the current amount deficit of a country will influence the exchange rate over time. A systematic idea. That's the kind of thing that might be in there. But an observation about Evergrande would not affect what I do at all, not in the slightest. The reason I brought up Florin Court a second ago was I'd sometimes order pizza, okay, when I was working late, and there was a Papa John's nearby. I think their slogan was better ingredients, better pizza. My point of view on trend following is very much better diversification plus better trends equals better pizza. I think our track record bears that out. Because if you look at the sharp ratio we've delivered over the last six years, it's about what you would expect if we were four or five times better diversified and had somewhat better trends than typical CTAs. I want to ask a question about this operations part of these diverse markets and unusual or off the grid places. China's not off the grid, but if you say to the average American or Brit, we trade four dozen futures markets in China. I think most people just immediately think, oh gosh, what's the operations of that? Is there anything you want to share or you could share about, we use China as an example, the process of starting to go down that path? It does seem a little daunting, I think, for most people because you won't even know where to start. The Great Wall is not there, but in a way, many people around the world probably still think the Great Wall is there. You start first off by becoming aware that there are very, very large futures exchanges and other markets in China. You should be aware of the world, aware of facts like that. We're following things like carbon markets around the world, different developing stories, rare earth elements, things that are happening in the uranium market. We're trying to look around the world at things we can possibly trade. So you start with that. Then the next thing you do is you start asking dealers and other experts What's involved with trading it? Why aren't more people trading it? And in the case of China, there had been a lot of restrictions about who can trade on these very, very liquid. These are huge liquid futures exchanges. In fact, the leading futures exchanges of the world are in China. Trading that with outside money is very, very difficult. In fact, they didn't allow it, basically. So then you start thinking about how am I going to go about doing this? Do I go onshore? Now, if I go onshore, can I get offshore money in there and out of there? Are there other ways to do it? And meanwhile, we are having discussions with people close to the regulator. For example, the Chinese have been in the process of gradually opening up their market to qualified foreign investors. Do you want to be one of those? So we began to engage with various counterparties, and we came to the conclusion that the best way to do it 
would be to face banks that have the ability and authority to trade in China and do swaps with them, create derivatives that are linked to the futures markets in China. We helped to pioneer this whole structure. We were one of the very first people to do this stuff. We worked very closely with a number of counterparties who were legally authorized to trade in China. And then we would trade with them. We would get an exposure through them, and then they would go and offset the risk. And we also got legal opinions all over the place to make sure that what we're doing is completely above board, we wanted to make sure the regulators are okay. Actually, so we became the pioneer in this, and then more people began to do what we did. And now there's actually a movement to become a qualified foreign investor in China, which has its pros and cons relative to doing it the way we do it. But our costs are very low because, again, we were the first and we have a special relationship with a number of our counterparties. When you describe these diverse markets, you start to give people a taste of what it takes to actually trade them. Yes, and it's different in every case. What you need to do is be very, very careful. You need to dot your I's. You need to cross your T's. You need to do your homework. You start small. You make sure you're having the right conversations with the lawyers, the regulators. We do not push the boundaries legally. What we do is we're willing to do the hard operational work. But if it were straightforward, everybody would already be doing it. There you go. One last question, unless there's anything else here at the end you might want to bring up that I didn't touch on. But there's something in your documents that I caught, just a simple little phrase, and I would love for you to explain it. I think I know what you mean, but you talk about signals must make sense, avoiding black box models, data mining exercises. But can you explain what you mean by signals must make sense? Okay. One example would be in the areas where we use some fundamental signals. An example of using a fundamental signal might be using a country's CDS spread to predict foreign exchange movements, or using a macro signal to use a current account deficit or the terms of trade to predict, again, a currency move. It ought to be in the direction that makes some sense, which is to say a worsening current account balance shouldn't be associated with an improving currency. Just common sense things. If somebody came to you and said, I really, really want to buy country X, their currency, because their current account deficit is so bad and it's deteriorating. I'd say, I think you might have that backwards. That would usually be an argument, unless you're saying it's completely oversold and I'm buying it because it's oversold. That's a different argument. You want things to be intuitive. Another point is you want to be mindful that you're not overfitting. Overfitting is just such a common problem in the systematic space. I can, of course, come up with a set of models that traded last year perfectly, and a set of models that traded the year before brilliantly, and a set of models that traded the year before even better, and they would all be different models. The point is to have a set of models which, in general, produce the best performance and are robust and stable across a variety of environments. The goal is not getting a good back test. The goal is getting good out of sample performance. The goal is delivering what we have done, which is a sharp ratio of about one with a positive skew following trend. That's the goal, delivering the results, not producing historical simulations that go from the lower left to the upper right. You can always do that with a very delicate model and overfitting the data and a bunch of signals that may actually turn out to be nonsense. You want to apply common sense. It looks like the world as it is has taken to your business because your assets under management have gone up pretty good here in just a short few years, frankly. So you guys seem to be off to the races with this concept of the 500 plus markets and being alternative to the alternatives. We've been around for a while. The Florin Court Capital Program began in 2017. You're talking about six years. How long has AHL been around? (laughs) They've been around a long time. (laughs) 
Our approach is just this. It's a little bit like the weightlifting that we're talking about. When you go to the gym, you concentrate on the next set. And you want your form to be perfect. You want your breathing to be right. You want the rhythm to be right. You want to get that last rep. You want to make every rep count. And it's the hard ones at the end that count the most. So you just focus on what you're doing. Then on the next set, you do it again. And on the next set, you do it again. And you do that workout after workout after workout. That's what we're doing with our business. We concentrate on the nuts and bolts. We're focused very, very hard just on being the best alternative market CTA we can be. That's how we got there. But we just focus on the day-to-day and trying to get that right. Doug, great stuff. Appreciate the conversation. You are a great storyteller. You really have a nice perspective. I enjoy it. The company, the firm, the fund, Florin Court Capital. Doug, where can people find you? They can probably find me on LinkedIn. They can write us at Doug at florincourt.com or info at florincourt.com. I found you quite easily, frankly, and you guys are very responsive, I have to say. So there you go. Matt Stevenson is our front office. So it would be Matt at florincourt.com. That's a great way to reach us. Doug, I appreciate it. Hopefully we can do these conversations in the future. I enjoyed. Hey, thanks a lot. I enjoyed it too. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.